This is a CyberPower PC Tracer 4 Studio 300. I purchased this laptop for personal use back in September of 2020, and overall, it's been a great laptop. At the time, it was one of the thinnest and lightest gaming laptops you could buy, despite containing components often found in the higher priced models offered by competitors. Two years later, I'm still using this as my personal PC, and besides its decreased battery life, I haven't had any complaints. But, unfortunately, there has been some wear and tear, mainly by the beak of our ever-troublesome parrot, Pop Pop. He is constantly getting into trouble, biting keycaps off my keyboard, destroying rolls of paper towels, biting, screaming, pooping, he really does do it all. So, the goal of our video today will be to repair some of the damage he's done. We'll accomplish this by 3D scanning the keycaps I do have left, reverse engineering new ones, and 3D printing replacements. After taking a look at what we had to work with, it looked like it would be possible to create replacements for both keycaps. The mechanism under the escape key appeared to be intact, and only needed to have one of its pins pushed back into place. The escape key was no longer with us, but the F1 key could be scanned in its place, since its geometry appeared to be exactly the same. I still have the N key, but it is cracking and missing one of the extruded features that helps hold the key to the scissor mechanism. For the 3D scans, I used a Steinbickler Comet L3D 5 megapixel structured light scanner. Before starting the scans, I first changed the lenses to match the size of the object I was scanning. These keycaps are very small, so I had to use my 45mm measuring volume lens set. This allowed me to scan at the highest resolution possible for this scanner, which really helped when trying to see the tiny features on the underside of these keycaps. Since the lenses were changed, the scanner needed to be calibrated. Performing a calibration ensures that the scanner will measure whatever you are scanning as accurately as possible. It's best practice to recalibrate anytime the lenses are changed. The calibration procedure will instruct us to scan a calibration artifact at nine different locations. To help make the calibration process easier, I taped down a guide to a flat surface. This guide will tell us where to position the calibration panel for each scan. Before starting the calibration, I checked to make sure the environment was close to 20 degrees Celsius. Parts are typically inspected at 20 degrees Celsius, per ASME Y14.5, so if we want our CAD model to match the design intent, we need to perform our calibration and our scans at the same temperature. As I said it would earlier, the software guided us through the nine calibration scans required to complete the calibration. When prompted, I moved the calibration panel between the scans. Once complete, the software provided a passing report and we moved on to the scanning portion of this project. Before coding and scanning, I used some sticky tack to fixture the part to the fixture plate on the rotary table. This will hold the part still during the coding and scanning process and will provide some separation from the data points scanned on the rotary table. Since this part's bottom surface was transparent, it needed to be coated with an opaque coating for the scanner to collect data on it. Before doing so, I cleaned the part with a swab to make sure no dust could have a negative impact on the coating or subsequent scans. The coating I used is titanium oxide powder mixed with denatured alcohol. I applied this coating using an airbrush to make sure it was as thin as possible. The goal here was to remove all transparency from the part, while still keeping added material and surface roughness to a minimum. Once the coating was applied, the features on the bottom side of the keycap became much more visible. Next, I removed the coating surrounding the part, making it easier for the scanner to see and identify target point stickers. The scanning software uses these target stickers to align individual scans to each other. I added a few more just to make sure there were plenty to choose from. We could finally begin the scanning process. 
I position the projector image over the part, using the two laser dots as a guide to tell me how far away from the part to position the scanner. Then I started scanning. When scanning the part, it is best to scan at many different orientations. The rotary stage helps make this process efficient by taking one scan at each rotation position. I'm always amazed by the quality of scan data produced by Structured Light 3D scanners. Features barely visible to the naked eye become much more clear when they are scanned. We were only a third of the way done at this point. In order to create a CAD model from this part, I needed as much scan data as possible in the cracks and crevices as well as data on the top surface of the part. This required me to reorient, clean, coat, and scan the part all over again in its new orientation. And finally, we repeated the same steps one more time to collect the third and final scan. Once all of the scans were collected, we needed to align them to one another and perform some cleanup. Since the part was too small for target stickers, we used some common points on the scanned part to align the scans to each other. Then we manually selected and deleted scan data collected on the sticky tack, leaving only the keycap scan data. And after performing a final global optimization, we created a mesh. This is always my favorite part of the process because it's the first time we're seeing the final product of the 3D scan. And overall, I think it turned out pretty well. Sure, there are a couple undercuts that the scanner couldn't see, but the level of detail is extremely high for such a small part. To put a cap on things, this mesh was then exported to start the reverse engineering process. Before moving into a CAD application, I took a quick detour into GOM Inspect. Because the mesh was just floating in some random orientation and location with respect to its coordinate system, I needed to create a new coordinate system to make the task of reverse engineering more easy. To do this, I used GOM Inspect's built-in tools to create features on the mesh. Then, I constructed an alignment using these features. Before accepting the new alignment, I displayed the new coordinate system in the 3D view to confirm it was where it needed to be. I also performed a smoothing operation in GOM Inspect. The purpose of this was to make feature extraction go more smoothly downstream. I like how GOM's Smooth Mesh function allows you to set a surface tolerance for the smoothing operation and displays a preview of the deviation between the new and old mesh. I then exported the mesh from GOM Inspect. To recreate the CAD model for this keycap, I used SolidWorks and a plugin called DesignWorks. Since this part is prismatic, I could have just used the CAD software to visually rebuild the model and then check its accuracy in GOM Inspect, but using a reverse engineering plugin like DesignWorks will help speed up the process. To start, I imported the CAD model into SolidWorks. This helped me visualize what needed to be modeled next, and was utilized by DesignWorks to extract features and evaluate the model as it was built. Next, I used DesignWorks to extract a sketch from the outer surface. Reverse engineering software doesn't know the design intent, so constraints still need to be set up manually within the sketch. And although the sketch was automatically extracted, there are always some tweaks that need to be made based on best practices and personal preference. Now that I had some geometry, I used DesignWorks to check its accuracy. Since I was just getting started, most of the part wasn't within the green 50mm tolerance zone. But at this stage, I really only wanted to see that the main outer profile was green. I then turned my attention towards the top face of the key. This surface was concave, so I needed to convert the top surface into a freeform surface. 
It took a few iterations, but eventually I was able to create a surface that closely matched what was on the real part. The next portion of the model I chose to tackle was the underside of the keycap. As I did when creating the main outer profile extrusion, I used DesignWorks to automatically extract the sketch geometry. Then I made some edits and added necessary constraints. Before moving forward, I checked my work by looking at the deviation between my model and the original mesh. There are two sets of features that hold the keycap onto the scissor mechanism. I chose to model the two Lego hand looking features first. To do this, I created a sketch plane through one of the features and visually sketched it out. After extruding it, I then mirrored it over to the other side of the model. The other features holding the keycap to the mechanism are small overhangs in each of the corners. There are probably a few different ways these features could be modeled, but I chose to use three extrusions stacked on top of each other. Once one overhang was done, I simply mirrored it to the other side of the part. Checking the deviation plot revealed that although I was getting closer to being done, there were still some areas with high deviation. Although I questioned whether or not these features contributed to the functionality of the part, I went ahead and modeled them anyway. With the main structure of the part finally complete, I turned my attention towards the label. Although I originally scanned the F1 key, this key will eventually become the escape key, so I labeled it accordingly. For the sake of time and your own sanity, I chose not to show this same process for the end key. Just know that the process was 99% the same. Now that the reverse engineering was complete, all I needed to do was have these parts 3D printed. I typically use shapeways for printing, but because of the thin overhangs, I had to send these parts to Protolabs to be printed using their microfine service. Once the parts arrived, I unpackaged them and had a look at the results. Overall, the parts looked pretty good. I was happy to see that the tiny features I had took the time to model were present on the parts. The individual print layers were visible on the top surfaces of the keycaps if you look close enough though, but I can live with that. I think going with Protolabs for this project was a good decision. If you're a 3D printing guru, let me know in the comments below which printing service you would have used for these parts. The parts look good, but will they work? I am pleased to report that after just a little bit of finagling, the parts assembled to the scissor mechanisms and are now working just fine. Here is what the finished product looks like. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you are in need of high accuracy 3D scanning or reverse engineering services, make sure to check out our website via the link in the description.